Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to that rare video every year where I discuss something that's actually relevant. So the Teal Mask is part one of the Pokemon Scarlet and Violet DLC, and this is the second generation to include DLC for their base games. And I'll say it, I quite like the DLC model. I would much rather prefer getting this type of content than spending another $60 on a slightly enhanced game. But how good did I think the Teal Mask was? How did it compare to previous DLC entries? Let's find out. But before we get into the review, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Honkai Star Rail. It's a new fantasy RPG from the makers of Genshin Impact. It's cross-platform and can be played on your PC, mobile devices, and soon PlayStation 5 by the end of the year. And you can keep your save data across all of these platforms. You can enjoy more than 20 playable characters and tactical turn-based combat. There are also two brand new 5-star characters that have just been released. And Bybiter Lune, a nobleman who controls both water and life with high DPS, definitely one of my favorites. And also, Fushuan, a young woman who leads the Divination Commission. She is a quantum-type character who can protect her teammates in battle by reducing the damage they take. It's always helpful to have one like this. Version 1.3 of the game is also rolling out, which includes more content after the main storyline's conclusion, a new version of the simulated universe, a roguelike gameplay mode, and if you log in for 7 days, you can claim 10 Star Rail Special Passes for free, which can be used to pull for either of the new characters. You can download Honkai Star Rail right now using my link in the description, and be sure to use the redemption code below to redeem 50 Stellar Jades. Thank you Honkai Star Rail for sponsoring today's video, let's get back to it. So to start off, we'll discuss the length and the map size. It's roughly the same length time-wise to complete as the Isle of Armor. You can probably do the whole thing in two to four hours, I'd say, depending on how leisurely you take it. I was actually taking the time to complete my entire Kitakami Pokedex while playing, and I say I still clocked in about under five hours. So if you played Sword and Shield's DLC, this isn't anything much more than that, which honestly I think is okay. I know some people had gripes with the map size of Kitakami and how small it is relative to Paldea. The way I see it, this is essentially $15 of the total $30 DLC, probably closer to $10 actually, because the second DLC should be way bigger if the Crown Tundra is anything to go off of. So if you think quarter of the price, $15, to the game $60, you get a quarter of Paldea, so it makes sense to me. I felt like Kitakami was a perfectly sized map, honestly, I had no qualms with it. On the note of the map, I felt like geographically speaking, it was also pretty well designed relative to Paldea. Even if you have your full Karaidon or Maraidon unlocked, which honestly you should, even though this DLC is designed to be playable with or without completing the main story, there's still some very interesting cave areas and remote locations that are just fun to explore. I much prefer this to their first attempt with the Isle of Armor, where it was just, hey, go to the dojo, now go to the forest, now go to the temple with like, zero interesting activities or areas to explore in between. In Kitakami, it feels like not only is there more room to explore, but the geography is actually interesting to traverse. Part of that is because it also has a good amount of geographical variety despite being a relatively small location. Although the mountain does take up most of the map, there are things like wetlands and rivers and forests all scattered around. And as somebody who literally just got back from Japan a couple weeks ago, I really enjoyed seeing a modern Japan-inspired region in graphics that could actually convey it. Because discounting Legends Arceus, I think Heart Gold and Soul Silver are the only games where you get that distinct Japanese feeling from a region. The other games don't lean too heavily into that style, and I really like that style, so to see it finally be realized in a 3D setting here was neat. Also, there's a very cool location at the top of the mountain. I'll give you a few seconds to avert your eyes if you don't want to be spoiled. But that was probably my favorite location on the map. Although, I was surprised that nothing super big in the story happened up there. I mean, something does happen there, but it's more of a setup for the next DLC, and it doesn't really involve Ogre Pond or anything like that. And of course, my other gripe is that despite it being a cool location, Ugh, man, the magic gets ruined when the game can't even hit, like, 20 FPS when you get up there. It's probably the worst performing area in the game, aside from, like, heavily forested areas. And I hate to bring the mood down, but we gotta talk about it. I realize I haven't shared much of my overall thoughts on Scarlet and Violet yet on this channel. I typically like to wait until everything is done, I have to replay the game a couple of times, and then have a fully formed opinion. But, good god, these performance issues are getting insane. Like, at launch, it was a bit embarrassing and annoying how poorly these games ran, but here we are nearly a full year later and many patches in, and it feels like the game still runs just as bad, if not worse in some areas. It's inexcusable at this point. 
It ruins the immersion, it makes me not want to play for longer than an hour at a time. At times, it can genuinely feel nauseating. Quick note, by the way, I just looked this up, and apparently they did break something in the code that made the memory leak issue way worse in this patch. I don't know exactly what, but it's good to know that I'm not crazy. And I hate to be that guy who harps on the performance so much, but it really prevents me from fully enjoying anything that this game has to offer. Like, I enjoy exploring Kitakami, until the game is absolutely chugging. I want to go into the forest and find cool Pokémon, but then it feels like the game is gonna crash at any second, and I'm like, eh, the vibes are just gone. And I know there's always gonna be that one person who's like, why does everybody complain about the lag? I have a day one Switch and my game runs perfectly fine. Like, okay? Congrats, you want us to buy you a medal or something? You're either just one of the lucky few, or you've never played a game besides Pokémon and are just oblivious to how poorly optimized these games are. It's like saying, well, I've never had the flu before, so it can't be that bad. Like, that doesn't mean it isn't real and doesn't affect most people in their lifetime. It's a bigger problem than just, oh, it's a little bit of lag here and there. Like, for most people, it's everywhere. But yeah, my point is, the absolute worst part of this DLC is that it's in Scarlet and Violet, games that run like absolute hot dog water 90% of the time. Sorry, but it's true. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Technically speaking, it's still Scarlet and Violet. Nothing is drastically better here, except maybe the texture work. I did notice some of the textures looked a lot cleaner than the stuff in the base game. There's no 240p Team Star flags waving around that I could notice, or textures literally sliding off the sides of cliffs. Maybe it is there, but I didn't notice it. So it's a very low bar, but there at least seems to be some improvement on that front. Next, let's move on to new Pokémon, and on this front, I am equally satisfied and disappointed. It's a weird feeling, let me explain. So, I think the actual new Pokémon that we got are all really cool. The Loyal Three are very unique, Ogre Pond is like universally loved, it has so much personality, great animations, the story does a good job making you care for it. Poltergeist and its evolution are like the first convergent Pokémon that I think are actually kinda cool and should be more than just regional variants. Diplin is fine, it's nothing crazy. And there is one other form that gets introduced here that I don't want to spoil, but I will say it's one of the sickest designs maybe ever. And the way you obtain it is also very cool, but that's it. And I know Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra also didn't introduce a ton of new Pokémon either, but man, I was really hoping for some new regional variants. Like, every time I saw a wild Pokémon like Poochiena or Changmoo or something, I'd think, man, a Kitakami in Evolution of these guys would go so hard! And after I filled in about half the decks, I had the painful realization of, there's probably nothing new here that I don't already know about. Paldea already had very, very few regional forms. I think it's just Wooper and Tauros if you don't count the Convergent Pokémon. And so to not have any new ones here is just a bit disappointing, because I really like the regional variants. And also, I'm not really hype about old Pokémon coming back in the DLC unless there is something new about them. They're always like, wow guys, look, a hundred Pokémon are coming back, and it's like, well, if none of them have anything new, then why am I catching them? It doesn't have to be a lot, it could have been like five regional variants and that would have been enough to keep me on my toes, give me a little suspense every time I evolve one of these old Pokémon, but nope, it's just Diplin. And we already knew that from the trailer, so it's not even that hype. I was hoping this would be the one area they improved on from Sword and Shield's DLC, but sadly not. But hey, Shiftery got Windrider as an ability, and that's hype. I still wish it was a Kitakami in Shiftery, but I'll take what I can get. There's also some side content here. I'll start with Ogre Alston, which again, if the game was properly optimized, I might somewhat enjoy it. But it seems like the consensus is that nobody is too fond of this minigame. I'm glad there's a minigame, don't get me wrong, I think too many of the modern Pokémon games just forget to include minigames like this, so I'm glad it exists, but it just feels way too grindy and not enough fun. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a side story here that isn't about the Teal Mask and involves Perrin the photographer in her quest to find this rare Pokémon in the forest. I think it's genuinely the best part of this DLC, I won't lie. The quest is fun enough, the last battle is quite challenging, and again, the Pokémon is one of the coolest ones I've ever seen. So I will give my props to that storyline. It was pretty good, albeit a bit short. And hey, there are actual side quests and stuff to discover here, which I thought was the biggest shortcoming of the main game. I don't know how many there are, but I have found a few already, and little stuff like that really does go a long way to making the game feel more soulful and less empty. Anyway, let's use that segue into the main story. 
It's a Pokemon story, alright? Is it bad? No. Is it great? Also no. I mean, I guess it's better than anything from Galar's DLC stories, if that's anything to go off of. Carmine and Kieran are good enough characters, as I mentioned earlier, Ogre Pond is amazing. There's a decent message here about insecurities and telling the truth and then getting revenge on your enemies in the next part of the DLC. You know, just really wholesome stuff. Kieran in particular has a really interesting arc where he goes from idolizing the player to hating you, which is something I'm fairly certain hasn't been done in a Pokemon game before, so that's neat. I'm very much looking forward to the end of his arc in the Indigo Disc. Again, if anything, I was a little let down by the lack of lore surrounding terrestrialization and why it exists in Kitakami to begin with. I think it has to do with Ogre Pond's masks, but like, how did those get there? I don't know, I do anticipate that most of the questions related to terrestrialization and Paradox Pokemon and all that will be answered in the Indigo Disc portion, but I was hoping for just a little bit more. But anyhow, for concluding thoughts overall, I rank this DLC above the Isle of Armor, but nowhere close to Crown Tundra, I would say. It definitely suffers from being in Scarlet and Violet with crappy frame rates and performance issues, but at the same time, Scarlet and Violet's open world style traversal is a lot more fun than Sword and Shields. And as a result, the general area of Kitakame just feels more interesting to explore, and that's probably its biggest strength compared to the previous two DLCs. If you don't like Scarlet and Violet, then sorry, this is not going to change your opinion of these games, I would think. Just because many of the same issues from the base game are still present here. It's very hard for me to give this a concrete rating because I honestly like a lot of the ideas in this DLC. But again, it's tied to Scarlet and Violet, and that's where most of the issues creep in. But hey, tell me what you thought of this DLC. Did you love it? Hate it? Mixed opinions like me? Let me know in the comments down below. But don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos just like this one. I'll see you guys next time.